The Soul is Not a Smithy by David Foster Wallace, Part 3. For the sake of the visual interest of the narrative that day, I wish that I could say that each panel of the story that the window generated from the view of the two dogs either mating or struggling for dominance remained animated, so that by the end of the class the window's wire mesh squares were all filled with narrative panels like the pictorial stained windows at Riverside Methodist Church, where my brother, mother, and I attended Sunday service each week, along with my father when he felt up to getting up early enough. He often had to work at the office six days a week, and he liked to call Sunday his day to try to glue what was left of his mind back together. But that was not how it worked. It would have taken some kind of mental marvel to hold each square's illustrated tableau in his memory throughout the whole narrative of the window. Not unlike the backseat game on trips where you and someone else pretend that you're planning a picnic, and he says one item that will be brought, and you repeat that item and add another, and he repeats the two mentioned previously and adds a third, and you must repeat and then add a fourth, which he must remember and repeat, and so on, until each of you is trying to hold a memorized string of 30 or more items in your mind as you each keep adding further to it by turns. This was never a game I excelled at although my brother could sometimes perform feats of memory that amazed my parents, and may even have frightened them a little, given how he eventually turned out, my father often referred to him as the brains of the outfit. Each square in the window's mesh filled and recounted its part of the story of the poor, unhappy owner of the brindled dog only while that particular square was attended to. It reverted to its natural state of thick transparency once the entire panel was actuated and filled, and the story moved on to the mesh's next square, in which the little girl, whose young and unworldly brindle-colored dog, Cuffy, had dug its way out under the shabby back fence and escaped down to the banks of the Scioto River, wearing a lemon-colored pinafore, pink hair ribbon, and shiny black patent leather shoes with polished buckles, was sitting in her fourth-grade art class making a Play-Doh statuette of Cuffy, her dog, all by touch, at the State School for the Blind and Deaf on Morse Raird. She was blind, and her name was Ruth even though her mother and father called her Ruthie and her two older sisters, who played the bassoon, called her Ruthie Toothy, because they were trying to convince her. We see this in three consecutive panels where the sisters, who are older and have the disagreeable expressions and akimbo postures that cruel people in cartoons always have, of how unfortunately homely she is due to her terrible overbite, and of how everyone can see it but her and there is nearly a whole horizontal row of panels of Ruth in dark glasses, with her little hands over her face, crying over the older sister's remarks and chants of Ruthie Toothy, your dog has gotten Luthy, while the little girl's poor but kind-hearted father, who works as a groundskeeper for a wealthy man in a white metal and canvas brace, who owns a lavish mansion in Blacklick Estates with a wrought iron gate and a curving driveway over one mile in length out past Amberley is driving the family's old, battered car slowly up and down the cold streets of their shabby neighborhood, calling Cuffy's name out of the open car window and jingling the Bringle dog's collar and tags. A series of panels in the very top row of mesh squares, which is often reserved for flashbacks and backstory elements that help fill in gaps in the window's unfolding action, reveals that Cuffy's collar and vaccination tags have gotten torn off as he wriggles under the Simmons family's yard's fence in excitement, overseeing the two stray dogs, one black and dun, and the other predominantly piebald, that have loped up to the cheap wire fence and urged Cuffy to come join them in some freely roaming dog adventures. The dark one, who in the panel has angled eyebrows and a sinister pencil mustache, crossing his heart over the promise that they won't go far at all, and will be sure and show the trusting Cuffy the way back home again. Much of the specific day's storyboard, which extends like arms or the radial spikes one often sees around a cartoon sun, involves the split narrative of small, pale, blind Ruth Simmons, who is not buck-toothed in the slightest, but is understandably not a very good Plato sculptor, sitting in her art for the blind class, wishing desperately that she could determine whether or not her father has been successful in finding the dog, Cuffy who is Ruth Simmons's faithful canine companion and never chews on anything or makes any trouble for the household, and often sits devotedly under the small, wobbly desk the father had found in the trash of the wealthy manufacturer he works for, and had brought home and nailed empty spools under the drawers of four drawer handles. And Cuffy often sits under there, resting his nose on Ruth Simmons's patent leather shoes 
as she sits in her dark bedroom. It doesn't matter to blind people whether the lights in a room are on or not, at the desk, and does her homework in Braille, while her sisters practice the bassoon or lie in the light on their bedroom's plush carpeting, talking pointlessly about boys or the Everly brothers on the princess telephone, often tying up the phone for hours at a time, while the father moonlights at his night job of single-handedly lifting heavy crates into the rear of delivery trucks, and the family's mother, an Avon lady who has never successfully sold even one Avon home product, spends every evening lying splayed and semi-conscious on the living room couch, which is missing one of its legs and is propped unsteadily up with a phone book, while the father tries to scavenge the right kind of wood to replace the leg, Mr. Simmons being the kind of poor but honest father who makes his living with physical labor, rather than poring over facts and figures all day. The top row's backstory of the window's large, black, and dun dog is somewhat vague and consists of a few hastily sketched panels involving a low cement building filled with dogs keening in cages and a back alley in a seedy district in which several garbage cans are overturned and a man in a stained apron is shaking his fist at something we cannot see. Then in the main row, we see the family's father getting a demanding phone call from the wealthy owner of the mansion, telling him to come back and start priming the large, expensive, gas-driven industrial snowblower for the mansion's long driveway with lines of small colored lights all along its length like a runway, because the owner's personal meteorologist has said that it's getting ready to snow again, like the absolute Dickens. Then we see Ruth Simmons's mother, whom we have already seen take several pills throughout the day from a small brown prescription bottle in her handbag, by way of another Upper Rose backstory, relieving the father and driving the battered family car aimlessly up and down the seedy neighborhood streets, very slowly and weaving a bit as a dense, persistent snow begins to fall and the street lights begin to glow and the panel's light turns ashy and sad, the way late afternoon in Columbus so often makes the ambient light seem sad. Essentially, I had no idea what was going on, just which specific aspects of the U.S. Bill of Rights were being covered by Mr. Johnson while this story of Ruth Simmons and her lost cuffy filled in panel after panel of the window, I cannot say, as by that point it is fair to say that I was absent in both mind and spirit. This tended to happen throughout this period. To be fair, this was the reason why Mrs. Roseman and the administration were determined to keep me away from distractions of all kinds, prohibiting Caldwell and I from sitting near each other, for instance. I do not remember even noticing just when it was that the exterior's dogs broke off their initial attachment and began moving in circles of somewhat different sizes, sniffing at the ground in the mud of the ball field's infield. The temperature outside was an estimated 45 degrees. It was melting that winter's second-to-last snow. I do remember that it snowed heavily the next day, March 15th, and that as school was closed on the day after the trauma, we were able to go sledding after several interviews with the Ohio State Police and a special Unit 4 psychologist named Dr. Baron Mayan who had a strangely configured nose and smelled faintly of mildew, and that later on that day, Chris Demate's sled had tipped to one side and struck a tree, and his forehead had had blood all over it while we all watched him touch his forehead and cry in fear at the reality of his own blood. I do not remember what anyone did to help him. We were all quite likely still in shock. Ruth Simmons's mother, whose name was Marjorie, and had grown up admiring herself in different dresses in the mirror and practicing saying, How do you do? And my, what a funny and amusing remark. And dreaming of marrying a wealthy doctor and hosting elaborate dinner parties of doctors and their wives and diamond tiaras and fox wraps at their mansion's beautiful burled walnut dining room table in which she looked almost like a fairy princess under the chandelier's lights. Now as an adult looked puffy and dull-eyed and had a perpetually downturned mouth as she drove the battered car. She was smoking a viceroy and had the windows rolled up and was not even rolling down the window to call Cubby, as the kindly, long-suffering father before her had done.